So welcome everybody. I am Christy Christy from IBC APAC. I am the vice chair for this term and I'm um, happy to welcome all of you to our free webinar. Today we actually have John Connolly of John Connolly and Partners. He's currently based in Sydney and um, we are excited to have him actually. John is extremely experienced and before I hop right into his um, some of the things he's done, I wanted to let you know we'd love it if you can tweet us on IBC APAC whenever you have a key takeaway from this session. Just go ahead and tag us in your tweets. That's IABC APAC. And um, our director of social media, Catherine Britt, would be extra happy about it. So please do that. Um, we'll be using a more Q&A type of format today. So after John goes through his slides, you'll be able to submit your questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So feel free to, to pop that in there. And we'll also be taking questions throughout. So feel free to, to put, put it in there even before we get to the Q&A um, section of the presentation. If you could share one key takeaway with us on Twitter, that would be great. We will share a recording of this um, session post webinar later today. We'll send a mailer out. So I'm going to get right to our speaker. John Connolly is actually one of the world's most experienced public relations professionals. He has over 40 years of consulting and he's done um, both. He has consulted and worked for some of the world's largest companies. He was president and CEO of Asia Pacific Operations of one of the world's largest PR firms, has been a member of the board of directors, as well as a five-person executive committee of the New York-based company. And companies have actually funded him to research new approaches to rebuilding trust and credibility, to increasing their social license to operate. And um, through this work, he has actually developed a unique approach around rebuilding and restoring corporate reputation and the development of a corporate brand concept. Now in 1992, John actually established John Connolly and Partners. It's an independent PR and government affairs firm in Sydney. And uh, the firm has already built an international reputation for successfully handling difficult and sensitive issues for large corporations, which are things that we are all facing nowadays in our workplace. So I feel free to raise questions on any issues that you may be facing. Um, the Q&A allows you to submit questions anonymously. So feel free to, to do that if, um, if it's something that you don't want to highlight your name. His, uh, his professional track record is actually impressive to say the least, but it turns out that what he does in his free time is equally <laughs> staggering. He, I was, I've had the pleasure to have a quick conversation with him and uh, found out that he has participated in everything from ocean racing to car racing, which is a sport he actually is extremely passionate about and he writes a column for it in The Australian. So without further ado, John, please take it away. Thank you. Um, if you hear um, singing, yelling, um, it's not about me, it's um, my apartment's across the road from a park next to Parliament House and there's a large protest going on. So uh, we'll do our best over the top of that. Um, one of the things that's interesting is um, how often everyone wants to have a seat at the table. So I think um, it's not just communication professionals that want to do that. Most people, most executives and most companies are always asking, how do I get a seat at the table? And I think one of the things that's important is that while everyone wants a seat at the table, you never just get it. You have to earn it. And that means, you know, even for people who are on the C-suite. So I think there's a physical table that people sit around and then there's the real table where people have real power. And my experience usually one or two people who um, are on named as part of the C-suite really aren't part of that. In other words, they don't really have much power at all. Um, so I think the other thing is it's worth working out who the CEO really listens to. So he or she will listen to people uh, on the C-suite, but they'll all ha also have some other people both in the company and outside. And I think the third part of all of this is, in getting listened to, is generally in large corporations, 
um, still uh, most executives who are not in the communications area have no idea what we do. And that's why people get fixated on measurement and all sorts of stuff. And why often we get treated as the messenger rather than um, an advisor. I think the first thing I can say is, you know, pretty basic, how do you get listened to, how do you get a seat, is be good to work with. Um, I'm sure all of you are, but in a lot of companies, there are people who are in our business who are either prima donnas or get frustrated um, because it is a struggle to get heard. And we have a knowledge that makes things very apparent to us that aren't apparent to people um, without our skills. It, it's very frustrating for us. Um, it's always a struggle to get heard. Um, and particularly on those days when no one gets it. So I, I think, you know, understanding it from the point of view that um, these people don't have our skills. Part of our job is to educate them, but equally part of our job is to find a way to um, make what we say and the advice we give accessible to them. Um, and I'll talk more about that as we go through. The key thing, um, particularly in large corporations and particularly successful corporations is to always deliver. So I like telling um, CFOs to say to the stock market, under promise and over deliver. And I think that's my advice for all of us as well. Um, you know, it's better to under promise and over deliver than do the opposite. Um, but you have to know two things. You have to know when um, the executive we're talking to expects delivery. Is that tomorrow? Is that, you know, this afternoon or is that in a year's time? The second thing is to know what good looks like. And the problem is, I think we all know what good looks like, um, but no one else does. So I think there's a, an issue of how do you frame what you're doing to create a real ex realistic expectation and to understand what they mean by good. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges I see, um, both internally and externally, but certainly internally, where someone say, thinks they do a really good job, but no one recognises it. And I think that's true in external communications as well as internal communications, although it's a bit more difficult externally, I think, than internally. I think you always should know what the politics are in a company. Um, every company, as you all know, and I have to tell you this, has politics. Um, and I wouldn't um, get involved in playing them too much yourselves. Um, but it does depend on the company. So the more dysfunctional the company is, the more the politics and probably the, <clears throat> the more you should play. But other than that, you know, if you're going to build a position of trust with anyone senior in the company, it's better to be straight, not to play um, the politics. It's important to understand what drives the CEO. Um, as you know, um, tenure in the US and Australia now for a CEO is about five years if you're lucky. Um, the ideal time is generally around seven to nine, but CEOs are getting judged much more quickly and being got rid of much more quickly. Um, there are CEOs that come into a company and with a definite plan to spend no more than three or four years, pump the profits up, get their bonuses and get out. So I think be pragmatic. You know, some chief executives, despite what they say, are there for the STIs and the LTIs. Um, and, you know, but I think it's really important to understand what the CEO's objective really is. Understand what the CEO's relationship with the board is like. All CEOs would love to manage the board. Some do quite successfully. Um, it's not very healthy, but it often happens. There's a thing happening now 
both in the US, UK and Australia, where regulators are making boards blur the lines between boards and management. So the healthy sort of governance structure where the board um, sits back, is not involved in the day to day, is becoming harder and harder to do because um, now the regulators are going after directors and the only way a director can fully equip him or herself is by de delving deeper into management, which of course, as you know, dro drives CEOs and C-suite officers absolutely mad. Um, so I know what drives each of the other people in the C-suite. Um, it's a rich tapestry of sociopaths and psychopaths and a couple of ordinary good people but understand that. I think it's always useful to get a mentor or two on the C-suite, and most of them will like doing that. So that's a useful thing um, to do up, to do. Finally, um, if you don't speak up, no one's gonna hear you. So I think be bold, be prepared to speak up, but can I just give you some guidelines that I've learned on that? The first one is beware the monkeys. And I'm sure you all know the story about um, monkeys on the back. So every day, every minute, a CEO is being given monkeys on his back. So it's problems in the company to solve. It's problems outside the environment, what's happening in the business, what's happening in the trade, what's happening globally. And his job is to get the monkeys off his back and give them to someone else. And that goes from through the C-suite on down and down. What I see happen a lot, particularly in our profession, is often we work at putting the monkeys back on. So instead of giving firm advice, we either say something like, well, here's what I think, what do you think? Or there's um, four or five recommendations here. Um, so I think it's better to um, give firm advice than give a range of options, unless you recommend one option, which is fine. But beware of whether it's in the C-suite or with your own supervisor, putting monkeys, trying to put monkeys back on someone's back because that is not helpful at all and just enrages the monkeys. And I realise I haven't flipped the slides. Sorry about that. Um, speaking insights and solutions. So the most valuable thing, two most valuable things to any executive team and or any board, in fact, are insights and solutions. You know, insights are something that you sort of go, ah, oh, when you hear it, and it sort of makes you think a different way. We should be quite good at doing that because we have access to a lot of information uh, that other people don't, which is why I always love doing small number of focus groups, even inside a company, um, you know, doing research outside because um, a lot of executives work on a feeling or they've read something in the paper or someone told them something. So I'd be able to give them um, a valid insight from research, from something else is really pretty useful. Solutions are always fantastic. And, you know, as you know, there's no fast cures for slow problems, even though executives would like to think it. But I think you can talk in terms of an approach to get us there. You know, there is no quick solution to this, but here's an approach that I believe will get us there. The other thing I'd say is you're in business, not communications. I think we forget that we work in business and we should really work hard to show how what we do is going to help bottom line, productivity, whatever it else it is, rather than just say, you know, we're getting engagement up or this people need to know this and here's a very clever way I've got to tell people. And finally, on all of that, um, I'd say be concise. Really, people aren't being rude um, when they shut you off. It's because you've gone on for too long. So whether you write or talk, whatever you do, um, just use the old-fashioned, 
you know, give me the, you know, you know, when Moses came down from the, uh, from the mountain, um, <clears throat> CNN interviewer uh, got hold of him, CNN reporter got hold of him and said, so just give me the three top commandments. And I think that's what you should do as well. So I'm going to leave it there and um, happily try to find some answers for your questions. Great, John. Actually, um, while we wait for the questions to start coming in, and everybody, please use the Q&A section just below your Zoom app. There's a little icon there that you can click and submit a question. If you have any trouble, feel free to use the chat. But to, to get the conversation going, John, actually, you mentioned that we need to make our advice more accessible to executives. And um, this is, you know, this is something that we were talking about earlier where, yeah. you know, back in 2015, there was a survey where over 70% of ex execs says they don't feel that their PR partners have articulated PR goals and strategies very well. And they can't understand um, how PR contributes to that. Why, why are we facing this gap considering we are, communicators right we are supposed to be able to communicate why why do you think that is is it the and, lack of and our business is hundreds of years old so i think a couple of things i think um industry associations have done a really bad job on that i think um inward industry associations generally are very focused internally and i'm not i'm not talking about the iabc but certainly others very focused internally rather than seeing one of the missions should be to demonstrate the value of what we do and get people to understand what we do. The second thing is at most business schools, um, there is either no um, lectures uh, on broad view of communications, corporate affairs, whatever. And if there is generally around the world, it's done by, with some exception, it's done by pretty second-class people. Um, and then thirdly, it must be a part of our job to demonstrate um, that we're an integral part of the business. Now, externally, that's becoming easier because um, people now, uh, business leaders, are having to navigate through extraordinarily difficult times so just talking about Australia, for instance, we've had, we're the world capital of royal commissions. We've had more royal commissions, which are like Senate inquiries in the States than anywhere else on earth. Um, and then as a result of those, regulators feel they need to do something. They've been instructed that um, the government want to see white collar people go to jail. Um, which certainly uh, gets people's attention. At the same time, you've had the Business Roundtable in the US come out um, talking about a very different view from the shareholder value view that they have uh, talked about for all their existence to a much broader view of what business stands for. Um, so I think you know the time is perfect for us to be doing this, but I think two things, one, we have to find a way to demonstrate um, what we do is an integral part of the business. And that means learning the language of business. And I think some of us find that hard. And I think also making what we do accessible. So rather than speaking in communications language, I think speaking in business language, the same language everyone else understands. Right. And actually, we've had some questions come in. And the first is coming from Jean Vieve Hilton. And Jean Vieve is actually based in Hong Kong. And she mentioned that some executives are unbelievers and they are convinced that the entire communications discipline is unimportant. Is there any point in trying to change their minds? So is it better <laughs> to grit your teeth and to try and hang on until they leave? Hopefully not longer than three to five years. <laughs> um, look, um, that's surprising. Jean Vieve or Genevieve, um, because in my time in Hong Kong and still in Hong Kong, I've found more believers than most other places. But look, I get that. I hear it a lot. And I'm sure people on the call hear that a lot. Um, and it, you know, there is a, there is some truth in that. I mean, if you've run a company for a long time and it's under the radar 
and it's run successfully and, you know, so why do you need public relations? Why do you need communications? Everything seems to be fine. It's probably not until some sort of crisis hits. It's not till some regulatory approach hits. And I think that's the value in being able to demonstrate that um, I believe what we do is about um, maximising organisational autonomy. In other words, what every business doesn't want is restrictions on how it operates. And I'm not saying that in a stupid way about cigarette companies or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, the problem is if we don't do a good job in a sort of a corporate affairs sense, you get the situation you've got now in Australia with the banks, it's going to happen to the nursing uh, retirement home industry, it's going to happen to the power, or it's already happened to the power industry, where the government puts more and more regulation on, which makes it harder to operate, um, shrinks your margins and makes the business less viable. So, um, you know, you can take a grin and bear it attitude, you can try that or go and find somewhere else to work. It might be a better, better pragmatic solution. <laughs> And the next one is from Louisa from Melbourne, Louisa Graham. And she said that, John, you mentioned that the most senior execs have no idea what we really do. How do we change that? Um, what are the types of engagement we need to do? What really works to change this perception? So, so um, the biggest thing that works is in a company of unbelievers is when some sort of crisis hits. So it's amazing how quickly um, people who are unbelievable get religion when there's a takeover, when there's a major something goes wrong, um, when there's some sort of accounting or other scandal. Um, all of those sort of things um, are quick to get people religion on what we do. I think, um, as I said, I think our industry associations have a lot to answer for. Um, you know, on the BCA, for instance, which is the peak business body in Australia, it's like the business round table in the US, there's no discussion of this sort of stuff unless there's some crisis going on. Um, you know, Louisa, all I can think is, um, is it worth things like, um, you know, getting people in to talk about um, using either case studies, probably is best in your industry, about what the difference could look like when um, communications is successfully integrated into the company. Um, but it's it's not a new problem. It's you know as long as I've been in the business, which is a very long time, it's been going on. Um, I think it's damning of the industry, it's of our industry, but I think you know, the ways to do it without a crisis are maybe, you know, getting, you know, whoever you're talking about, the C-suite, CEO, whatever, exposed to um, someone they respect talking about case studies showing how it successfully can contribute to your bottom line. I mean, certainly there's no one in a bank in Australia now or in the US or in the UK that would be agnostic about what we do. Um, they mightn't completely understand it, but you know they're over investing. Let me tell you. All right, and the next one is from Catherine Britt. Um, she's actually a director on IBC APACT as well, and she she asked whether you can talk a bit about the role of critical thinking and problem solving in getting a seat at the table. Um, well, I think you know that I get all that. I understand the talk about that. I think the role is to come up with insights and solutions. Um, so the critical thinking and the problem solving is an approach to an objective or an outcome, and the outcome is insights and solutions. I mean, you know, probably, I'm not exaggerating, at least five or six times a year, I'm called into a board meeting either of a big company in Australia in Asia or particularly in the US um, to give them either an insight or a solution they're not getting from anywhere else. Um, 
And my ability to do that has come from being in the business for a very long time and from understanding what we can bring in terms of insights and solutions, which often aren't the traditional, um, what we'd call communication insights and solutions. So I think the critical thinking, the problem solving is only a step to getting to those insights um, and solutions. And that's what we really should focus on. We, we need to talk insights and solutions um, rather than anything else. Right, right. And um, we've got an anonymous question that says that it is sometimes <laughs> a challenge. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you my age. <laughs> oh, no. I, I think that's going to be a one-on-one -on -one with John. You'll, you'll have to do it <laughs> offline. But um, there's sometimes a challenge getting executives to align talking points or their key messaging. For example, communication versus PR style versus business style. What would be the yeah. best way for these business leaders to see the importance of following communications, um, the key messaging guidance that is being provided? Okay, so I, I think um, the way to do that, which I found the most successful, well, let me go back a step. Um, I think one of our most important skills is to be fluent um, both in writing and speaking, right? Um, so that when we give advice, um, when we're talking, the people we're giving advice to, we make it very, very um, ex uh, accessible. Um, so in um, writing, we need to write in the way that people talk. And the way I've found to get people to understand that is to say to them, you know, looking in the media, which business leaders, which politicians do you think are the most effective? Um, you know, and you'll, they'll name a couple of people and you'll be able to say without doubt, unless they're pretty weird, you'll be able to say, well, the reason they are is because they talk like real people, right? And they make a number of, just a small number of key points but they make it in a way that touches people. So let's go back a step. I think there's two important things. One is what, what is communication? And the second is what business are we as communicators in? Communication is not getting the message across. Communication is about shared meaning and shared understanding. And, you know, the objective of any executive or any person in you know who we're communicating is to get to that shared understanding i mean i can talk more about that if you like but that that's what we're on about we're about shared understanding not getting a message across right the second thing is what business are we in we're in the business of information management and i know that sounds bad it sounds like propaganda or whatever it's not what it means is we should understand the world we're in better than anyone else in a company or an organisation. From that understanding, we're able to get executives to frame what they say in a way that gets to that shared understanding. So too many um, executives, not too many politicians now, but too many executives talk in a language that no one else talks in. And they still do that if, they, if you let them send out their own internal communications, right? Um, it's in, it's un, you can't understand. It's written a language that no one ever uses, and it's usually at least five pages long. So let me come back. So the objective of what we do is shared understanding, and the business we're in is information management, which means understanding the world we're in and being able to advise our executives how to communicate in a way that gets to that shared understanding. So I'd come back to the point of saying to that executive, who does a good job? Who does a good job in business that you admire? And doesn't matter where it is, US, UK, Asia, wherever it is, Australia, what politicians do a good job? Um, 
And so let's analyse what they're doing. And what they're doing will be always exactly what I said. It's very accessible. Um, it's um, based on a shared understanding. It's relatively brief. You know, it's on message all the time. Um, so I think that's the best way. And I, um, John, from what I can tell, actually, even based on your answer to the earlier question, is that accessibility is key, not just to create a shared understanding with um, your stakeholders outside of the organization, but also within the organization. A shared understanding, if you will, between PR and comms and even the executives. And um, yeah, yeah. it sounds like one of those things is um, to speak in a language they understand, which you mentioned business language, and that would require business acumen. So I was wondering if you have any recommendations on what communicators can do to develop the business acumen necessary. So well, well I think can... it's more, yeah. So I think two things. One thing I always say, including the people who um, work for us, is I get them to do something like the Australian Institute of Company Directors course. And there's equivalents most places in the world and if there's not where you are, you can do an equivalent online from Australia or the US or somewhere else. <clears throat> the other thing I think is important, uh, another way of tackling that is the equivalent of um, Securities Institute course, which is meant for analysts and people in financial markets, but it's not as complex as, say, doing a CPA. I think they're really good... I, I prefer the Australian Institute of Company Directors course, even if you're not a company director, um, because it gives you a much broader view and um, it's not as you know, complex as some of the others. So I think you know, that's really quite important. Anything that, you know, as I said, um, to get to a shared understanding, you really have to understand your audience. So if you're talking to a board of directors or you're talking to the C-suite, you have to understand how they think and how they talk. So I think both those are incredibly useful. All right. Um, and the next question is coming from Mala Ramalingam from Malaysia. Mala asks, what about profiling the CEO, especially in terms of in, on social media? Because given the role that CEOs are now coming for very short term, three to five years, um, should the tone be very much theirs or more corporate? Um, well, um, having spent time in Malaysia and having actually some clients in KL, um, it's been a little bit slower there. But my recommendation would be, so first of all, let's talk about social media. The only thing any executive wants to know about social media is how to get rid of bad comments. So that's your first job, right? That's their prime interest. Then social media is a bit like you know, all the management trends we've had, management by walking around, you know, uh, management by hula hoop, whatever else. So now everyone wants social media without really understanding what it's about. Um, I think, um, you know, and you would know, all you people would know social media and the rules and stuff better than I. But I would say if you're going to do social media, you know, it's terribly important that, the more you're like me, the more I'm going to like you. So now, in some um, cultures, that's not completely true. But in general, in a westernised culture, I think it's far better um, that you speak in the language everyone else speaks in rather than your view of what business, your CEO's view of what business language is. Um, you know, as we're seeing more and more, and as you think about the really successful CEOs rather than the ones who just get all the publicity, um, this idea of being grounded, of being humble, I know it's hard to be humble when you're so good, but being humble, um, being seen with employees, with customers, I think is just getting more and more critical. Right, and... Um, so if that doesn't answer your question, just um, give it to me again. Okay, but I mean, that lets us actually circle back to the fact that um, when we say that we need to 
we need to be the ones in the organization who know our worlds best, right? Who knows the world best. And currently with social media and the current climate, the fact that you're on social media, when there are social issues, more and more of our readers and our stakeholders and our customers are expecting our CEOs and our thought leaders that we are developing to participate or to have an opinion on that sort of thing. And so not a week goes by without major corporations grappling with what um, stands to take on a social issue. Do you have any advice for communicators who need to support <laughs> that decision-making process? Yeah, be careful. Um, <laughs> look, so let's run through it. I think um, the negative side of being too involved in issues outside the business is that if you're not performing well, um, shareholders and others will wonder why you're doing that rather than focusing on the business. The second thing is that you need to be, um, I hate using the word authentic, but be engaged in issues that you can authentically be engaged in. So, for instance, um, I think it's hard for coal companies to be very engaged in climate change, uh, the climate change issue. Um, I think that if you're going to hold yourself up Bear in mind the power of social media is the transparency. And if there's any skeletons in the closet, they'll find it. So I think all of that's important. I think if there's issues you believe in, and I think, let me give you a good example. So um, the boss of Qantas, our major airline in Australia, um, is proudly gay and was a proud advocate of same-sex marriage in Australia, which was a big issue and finally got resolved uh, in a good way. Um, he had every right, I believe, and many of his staff, because of the industry, are, um, you know, uh, uh, in the gay community. He had every reason and he was authentic in what he did in very being heavily involved in that campaign. So that's a perfect example of good. I think where you get involved because some of your peers say you should be involved or you're just trying to latch onto something is not very good. And so my view on all of this is for us as communicators to think through leadership positioning. So to really, and, and if you, um, if I'm sorry, not talking, if you're not getting what I'm saying, happy to send you some notes on how to think about leadership positioning. Um, you know, so I think do it as you would do any other sort of project you're going to be involved in. Take a professional approach, follow a format, and then get to the sort of issues that you can be involved in and should be involved in. But too many CEOs get involved just because it's good for their ego rather than good for the business and good for the people in the business. And bear in mind, whatever you do, the people in the business are going to, you know, all your employees are going to judge you. So it needs to be something that resonates authentically with them as well. All right. We have a question from Christopher Guzman. And his question was, what do you think is key in a strategic plan when coordinating international cooperation in global communications? So within a company, is that, is that the? Um, I think we can go, yeah, go within international cooperation. So yes. Uh... So um, the biggest thing is politics within companies and globally, who's in charge, whose territory you cutting into, all of that sort of stuff. So um, the, the starting point always is the objective when you're doing a strategy. What are you trying to achieve? Um, and I like starting with the objective and working backwards. And I find, you know, in facilitating, you know, meetings of communication professionals, whether it's online, whether it's in person, you know, by teleconference or whatever, that if you've got a clear objective and then you work backwards on how you get there, um, 
it does tend to be pretty helpful in getting rid of some of the politics. But, you know, I think the problem is in most companies, um, silos are still in, still um, powerful. Um, so wherever their head office is, whoever the head office um, communications boss is, will really want to protect their turf and see that they're controlling everything. Um, so I think, you know, the way around that is start with agreeing an objective and then work back. So in other words, you're sort of working backwards rather than forwards. So start with the objective uh, and work back. The other thing I'd say is there is, despite technology, and some of my clients have the most fantastic, um, you know, video technology where you really feel like you're sitting next to people. Despite the technology, there's nothing gets past a face-to-face -face meeting. So if you're getting barriers, you know, if you can get everyone agree to meet somewhere and thrash it out over a day or two days, you know, you, you can get past a lot of the barriers you have to that sort of cooperation. And actually, I think that helps answer one of the questions we received on how to overcome people who want to shut down um, PR or our ideas. And that would most likely from the sound of it. <laughs> is to have an agreed up. I think, that's, I think that's, that's an overriding theme of today, which is... <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, and the next one is from Victoria Button, and she asked if you Sorry, could... I missed that. Oh, Victoria Button, and she oh, asked yeah. if you could give an example of a non-traditional insight or solution. Any stories, perhaps, that hey, might... Um, I'm losing you, so... Can you give an example of a non-traditional yeah. insight or solution that you've come across and it came from Victoria? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have to be careful about this. Um, this is one that really comes to mind, but um, yes, well, one we was advising a board that the only circuit breaker was for the CEO to go. Mm. And um, that was backed up with insights from uh, shareholders, from investors, uh, that sort of stuff. So, um, so I think one of the things is um, if you're looking, often if you're in a difficult situation, if often we're advising on a difficult situation, you're looking for a circuit breaker. You know, in other words, if business goes on as it is, if the crisis goes on, if the problem goes on, you can do all the proactive communications you like, um, but um, basically it needs a circuit breaker. And often that circuit breaker will be something like, um, let's get an independent inquiry into this. Um, let's get um, a former judge to review this. Uh, um, Let's, um, you know, um, draw a line in the sand by changing something in the business. Um, let's um, ask someone to leave or the most possible way would just fire them. Um, so, you know, getting to a circuit breaker is sort of non-traditional communications, but I think a very important part of what we do. But, but being heard on that, means we do have to understand the world around us. So you need to be able to say, here's where the media are on this, here's where our own people are on this, here's where the regulators are, here's where the shareholders are. You know, this is one of the only feasible circuit breakers. There might be two or three. Here's the one that I think or we think um, will um, get us out of this problem and allow us to build back. And I think that usually is a very much a non-traditional. It's not more PR, not more communications. It's something that the business has to, the C-suite or the board have to do and agree to. I think that's, that's very important actually. And I really like the idea of a circuit breaker. This is definitely something that's gonna get tweeted 
Um, we have another question from Elizabeth Vala, and her name, her question was striking a balance between an authentic voice of a CEO or echoing the voice of the audience and toning down their business speak can be really challenging. <laughs> what would you advise yes. leaning on uh, when developing messaging? Um, Elizabeth, that's um, really important. I I'm not a big person on authentic because I think often, I'm not saying be <laughs> inauthentic, but often imagine a CEO who's looking at the numbers saying the business is going into the toilet, going very badly, that whose wife's just been diagnosed with cancer, who's um, got a few other problems and has found the CFO's been taking a bit of money that he or she shouldn't. Um, and has to come out and either face shareholders or staff, um, he's just going to have to be optimistic when authentically he's feeling terrible and would like to tell everyone how terrible he, it is and how thing, bleak things are. I don't think being authentic like that does anyone any good. So I do think there's a mixture even on authenticity or what people call authenticity. I'd come back to... Um, this idea of, you know, making stuff accessible. And I, and I think this idea of showing a CEO or showing an executive, asking him or her, and, and it's particularly important with women to find some good role models of people who do it well, um, but to say, who do you think does a good job? And analyse what those people are doing to do a good job. I don't think there's a conflict between um, understanding, you know, what people are thinking um, and um, creating a shared understanding. I think it all works together. So I'm not saying in any way fake it, I'm, but I am saying, oh, here's a good, maybe here's a better way to think about it, Elizabeth. Maybe it's, I like the idea of um, saying to an executive, look, imagine you're having a good a dinner with a good friend, a, a dinner with a good friend, and over a bottle of wine or whatever you drink, um, you're talking about this issue. But the friend isn't in our business. Um, they're not financial experts or they're not construction experts or they're not whatever experts. Um, and talk to them, you know, talk, how would you talk to them, right? You wouldn't talk down, right? But you'd work at making what you're saying very accessible. And I think that's the way I'd think about it, that the worst thing you can do is be patronising and sound like you're talking down. You're not doing that. You're taking, and, and this is our job, our job is to take some of the most complex information you know, in the world today, whether it's because of the industry we're in, because of what our companies do, whatever, and make it accessible. And you see the people that do that well, whether in politics or in business or in churches or in mosques or wherever they are, are very, very powerful. Um, and I think that's very much our job and how we should think about it. So maybe that, Elizabeth, that dinner model is the way to think about it that say to the person, and you can role play the friend, okay, talk me through this, but I'm not, you know, in the construction or IT industry or whatever. I'm not um, a CFO. So just, you know, without talking down, just tell me about it. And then I think from there you can start refining messages. All right. And, um, John, in terms of these, um, the way PR has been shifting and changing, thanks to social media and everything else, and the recent focus on big data and analytics, it can be rather difficult to provide the kind of data that um, executives may be expecting. Would you, have you seen a difference in the type of measurements or um, points that they're looking for than they have in the past? How, uh, how would you recommend PR and comms actually tackle this in terms of their strategies? Um, so can I go back a step and say that the thing we haven't discussed today 
is, I think, the most important thing internally as well as externally. So I think externally, over the last four or five years or since the GFC, there's been an enormous amount of discussion on trust, um, you know, to all our external stakeholders, right? And how do we rebuild trust? How do we rebuild trust in our industry? How do we rebuild trust in our company? How do we rebuild trust with our um, shareholders? I think it's actually more important internally, which is why I'm not a big fan of measures, and I don't die when I say this, not a big fan of measures like engagement and stuff like that, because I don't think they really tell us what's going on. Um, I think the critical driver of successful business inside the business is trust because without trust you can't have cooperation and so the question earlier about you know what do we do what do i do in an international company trying to get people you know to work together towards a common strategy or objective the reason you can't do that is because there's not sufficient trust or you've got a megalomaniac running the show but it's around trust i think all of us should start thinking about how we have better discussions internally around building trust from the chief executive down at all levels. You know, how do we get people working cooperatively, you know, for similar objectives? So I think that's one thing. I think every time we've done, um, you know, we've seen, gone into a company, seen reasonable engagement scores, you know, Yammer things, whatever else, and then done some independent focus groups where people feel, felt, staff felt they could talk openly and honestly, the results have been staggering. The differences have been enormous. Um, the bigger the company, the more bureaucratic the company, um, the more that's going to be the case. It's like change management. In most big companies that have been around for a long time, employees have... Um, expressions which I can't use here because you're all um, I mean good company but expressions to uh, how they react to the next lot of change that's coming through and they know and I can talk about you know so let's talk about banks in Australia and you would have seen this uh, most of you would have seen this in wherever you are in the world or whatever your business is new chief executive comes in and there's a new cultural change program or there's a new objective, you know, it's put yourself in the shoes of the customer, it's the Asia strategy, it's the whatever it else it is strategy, agile strategy. And that lasts for about three or four years, the chief executive gets fired, doesn't work, business goes back to normal, and it just reinforces everyone in the company's view or everyone that's been there for a while, yeah, we were right to do nothing. So this enormous cynicism within corporations, within organisations, um, you know, is really hard to overcome. And I think I would argue that the way, the best way to get measurement on that is even if you do it yourself, I remember, um, this is going back a while, but I remember a very large organisation, which was a bank in the UK, um, you know, I said, I'd really recommend doing this. And they said, no, we think it's a waste of time. We're not going to do it. I said, okay. So can you arrange for me to go around four or five o'clock at night when the branches are closed? And I'll just sit around and have a cup of tea with the staff. And I did that over about four weeks, and God knows, through all throughout England and sat down with people. Um, and the results were just as I predicted and as I've just talked to you about. So I think anything that can bring the objective reality. In other words, at the moment, often it tends to be our opinion based on our professional background. Anything that can bring a bit of objectivity to that is really useful um, to, get past, uh, to get past that. In terms of often, you know, so if you can't measure it, it's not right, which is every business school teaches. Um, Often measurement in what we do is but because of people who don't have a clue about what we want to do and they see some measure. 
So they're very happy if engagement scores are rising or some other score or whatever. If that makes them feel happy, good, we'll do it. Um, there's only one really objective measure in Australian business uh, of listed companies, and it's called the Corporate Confidence Index. It comes out once a quarter. It's where the market rates chief executive boards and senior executives. And I bet, except for one or two of you, none of you have seen it because no one, no chief executive wants to see anyone see the truth of that. So getting the truth across is really hard. I think finding objective measures, objective proof, if you like, for what you're doing is really important. Otherwise, just play the game. All right. And uh, since we're running out of time, there are two more questions. I'll start with Sia. She's president of IBC Victoria. And she, men <laughs> she mentioned that, um, you know, she was recalling back to when you mentioned professional associations and the role that they play. What yeah. advice would you have for, because there are many IBC leaders on this webinar, how can yeah. they facilitate a better conversation and initiate action on building the capability and value of um, communication professionals? Outside of running these types of events, what, what would you recommend? Yeah, look, I'm, um, as you know, I'm a long-time member of the IABC. Uh, I think I joined originally in the US, but um, so I'm a big fan. I, I just think all of us in industry associations, and I'm a member of just about every one, look to internally. And so while we've got to do professional development for ourselves, I think we should look at how can we do professional development for our clients, our clients meaning the people we advise, whether as consultants or in companies. How, what can we do to lift their understanding of um, what we do and the effectiveness and the critical importance of what we do? I think, you know, if we could spend maybe 30% of our time doing that, that would be extraordinarily valuable, both for the profession as a whole and for all of us in it. All right, I mean, if you want some ideas, so I'm happy to give you some ideas of what I think about that and happy as a member to give you some ideas. So, but I think, I don't think we spend enough time thinking through how we educate our clients. And, and I think that actually brings us back to the, this whole issue of where most senior executives have no idea what we do because we haven't educated them sufficiently, whether from internally or even externally. But um, And business schools themselves have done a bad job on that too. Right, right, exactly. And, and if we don't speak business language, then it's going to make that gap just a little harder to cross. Um, yeah. Coming to Mala's question from Malaysia, she mentioned yeah. um, how she enjoys taking actually media and key stakeholders out of their office and work settings. So perhaps um, having conversations with them, taking them out for, you know, just entertaining them. But, uh, and this is something you mentioned a bit earlier about going out for coffee and finding out people's thoughts and things like that. However, there is an increasing challenge she faces from finance departments, especially of very large corporations, <laughs> that this <laughs> constitutes bribery. What is your view? Um, I know the issue in Malaysia, so and it's a very recent issue, so I get that. Um, in most jurisdictions of the world, um, that's taking journalists as long as not lavish and whatever, well, even if it's lavish, but most jurisdictions, um, meetings with journalists, that sort of stuff, certainly don't constitute anything like bribery. I think you become more careful when it's politicians. Um, in some countries, um, you know, the brown paper bag, you know, developing countries, the brown paper bag is expected and that can cause serious trouble for um, corporations. I think um, in Malaysia, you've got a particular issue because of what's happened recently, which you would know about. Um, so I think, you know, it means what I do is maybe talk to the legal counsel about how to frame it. So it's, it is um, just relationship building with particularly with media. Um, and, you know, maybe that means there's a restriction on how much you can spend or whatever else. But, um, I think that's probably the way to do it, given the sensitivity right now in Malaysia. Um, but I think, you know, if you're friendly with the legal counsel, I think 
that'd be the way to um, put some some borders around it, you know, put your own rules around it. Um, you know, so for instance, at the big mining companies around the world, they've got a, a limit on what you as an executive can accept as a gift. Um, and if it's above that amount, you send it back. Um, there's a limit on, you know, there's very severe dealings because um, having worked in the resource industry a long time, um, we've seen um, executives um, and companies being fined enormous amounts of money for, you know, what was simple relationship buildings with politicians and others. So um, you've got every right or they've got every right to be careful. But I think if you put some your own ground rules around it, then you won't attract um, the attention of any regulators or anyone like that. Thank you so much, John. It looks like we should have booked you for a more like a three-hour slot because <laughs> the time has flown by. However, from what I can see, if um, I may offer a recap, it sounds like in PR and comms, we really need to start speaking the language of business. We need to understand what are the concerns of our CEOs and executives and build relationships within the organization. Uh, my key takeaway, one of those items was actually the circuit breakers, as well as not putting monkeys back on the back of the CEO <laughs> <laughs> to be bold. Well, that's for those countries with monkeys. You know, yes. we've just got politicians here, so. Oh, we've got monkeys and they're not <laughs> friendly. <laughs> so they're like the monkeys. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, I would appreciate it if everybody can share their key takeaways on Twitter, tag IBC APEC. I do recommend following John Connolly on LinkedIn. He has published several articles and uh, when you follow him, you'll be able to see those publications, comment on them, and perhaps even ask more of your questions through LinkedIn. Uh, the rec recording for this webinar, by the way, will be shared via email together with a survey because this is one of the few times we've actually tried a fully, almost fully Q&A format, and I'd like your feedback on that. Our next webinar will be about the Gold Quill Awards within a month or so, and we've got a couple of others lined up, which you'll hear about um, in our IABC mailers and social media. But John, thank you so much. This has been enlightening. Um, we really appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and thank you, everybody.